So we're going into a new section on bedding plant production. And I want to start out this section talking about containers. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of containers that we're going to talk about. Injection molded containers are manufactured from polypropylene. Um, the polypropylene is typically from a recycled uh, material. Uh, the injection molded containers, in other words, a mold is built and they inject the liquid um, polypropylene into the mold to form the pot. They're the strongest, they last the longest. They can be washed and used time over and time over and time over again. And uh, they're tolerant to, to steam sterilization. In comparison, are the vacuum molded containers. And what we do is take a, a sheet of plastic and we pull it over a, uh, it's, it's melted to a warm temperature and uh, placed over the mold and a vacuum is pulled and it shapes to the mold with a vacuum. They're made of polystyrene. So it's a different material. Um, the holes and everything else is usually then die cut um, to make them uniform and they can be co-extruded or vacuum molded for different colors and multiple colors within one container. <coughs> the other thing about polystyrene is polystyrene um, can be printed on um, and they make their inkjet printers and offset printers that will print directly onto the polystyrene and uh, this is good for barcoding and is also good for logos and point of purchase uh, advertising. So how do you choose your container? Well, the container is often set by the retailer. If you're growing your own crops, you have the flexibility to use whatever size container you want because you're selling it and you don't have to market in a specific way. Uh, some people use specific containers to differentiate their product from others. For instance, Hardy Boys. What color is a Hardy Boy container? Red. It's red. What color is a gully container? It's lavender or purple. Uh, so it's, it's somewhat uh, to differentiate your product to other customers. Um, and it also helps many uh, growers will use it to offset site grown plants, for instance, at gully greenhouses here in town. Um, they'll have, um, they bring in flats from Hardy Boys that are red and then they have their own materials that are in the purple and the lavender and they use it to offset their different color combinations. And it, if you're going into an outlet store and you're looking for a market, uh, it, it helps uh, differentiate your crops. In a wholesale environment, you need to know what the retailer wants, okay? Some retailers are very specific in what kind of container they want. The, um, oftentimes, uh, most retailers want standardized units. In other words, the box stores, they have uh, their advertising literature, the flyers that go out in the newspaper, typically advertise a specific size. So all of their people that want to contract grow for them or grow in with them, they need to have a specific size. And we'll get into that a little later on the issues that are involved in that. There are retailer specifications. Um, we used to call a number one nursery can a gallon, but it's not a gallon, it's less than a gallon, so we can't call it a, a gallon container anymore. Also, if you're a wholesaler, uh, some people like to maintain a small inventory for efficiency, but then again, some retailers will identify price changes, especially because these are made from fossil fuels. They're looking at fossil fuel prices at the same time, trying to offset perhaps a price increase with fossil fuel changes. So the injection molded flats, um, here's a typical they're all different kinds. They're web form, uh, solid, they're sturdy, they last a long time, they're easy to carry, they typically don't crack with weight. Whereas the, um, they make injection molded flats both to contain uh, packs and also injection molded flats for uh, plug production, uh, plug trays, um, all different kinds. And the benefit behind the injection molded polypropylene is they're, they're, 
they're rigid, they last a long time, and typically most growers are going to use them over and over and over again. Uh, a lot of nurseries use it for plant propagation material. If you're growing your own plugs and coming back, you can put these through a washer and sterilize them and use them over and over. So, with the, uh, which ones do you choose? There's other kinds of uh, products you can use. Peat pellets, peat pots. But I'm gonna have to say that in the bedding plant industry, the polystyrene vacuum formed is probably the most common. It's inexpensive, they're very cheap, they're pretty strong, they're light, which is the biggest thing, the polypropylene flats are very heavy, and if you've got a greenhouse, uh, if you're shipping a truckload of plants in polypropylene trays, the trays themselves are gonna have a significant contribution to the weight in the truck. They have the greatest flexibility because they have the most different kinds of designs. And the standard tray, we call it a 1020 tray, is actually measured 11 inches by 21 inches. We call it a 1020. It gets worse. This is also the standard tray is standardized for most mechanical systems. So another thing that you need to think about in choosing your containers is adapting to mechanical systems. The vacuum form trays, they look the same, but they're very thin. Um, they're lighter. We have different kinds of trays, different kinds of flats, almost everything like you would have with the polypropylene, but this product is polystyrene. And they're typically manufactured with several different ways. This is a picture of a polystyrene tray that's got center ribs. And the idea behind the ribs in this particular case is the ribs itself gives the, the, the tray more structural strength. And I'm sure we've all picked up a flat and have it break in the middle, okay? This one is less likely to break in the middle. You also see that it's got channels underneath because we're gonna put packs inside each one of these units. The channels are designed to uh, allow room for the water to, to run out. So most flats have pockets and most flats have holes, but some of them don't. Just depends on how you've, how you've uh, what particular model you have ordered. But there, this particular case is channeled to drain water out. No drainage, uh, sometimes some, some of these trays will be manufactured with the drainage holes mounted part way up. So they have a reservoir of, of water in the container, but then again, the roots are actually sitting in water for some period of time. Depends on the crop. So the flat itself, the tray, this is your delivery tool. This is the tool that we're gonna use to handle and move uh, your plant materials in your greenhouse. This is your delivery tray, this is your shipping flat, uh, and so forth. <coughs> Vacuum form flats, like I said, they have ribs inside uh, for structural strength. Uh, with the ribbed trays, however, you have to understand that once you start using ribbed trays, you've limited your flexibility to specific size packs. And again, the packs that you use depends on the market that you're targeting. They're stronger for carrying plants, and um, they're also designed to lock the flats in place so that when they're shipping, the flats don't move in the truck, move on the, in the tray, or when they're on the bench and the customer comes through and is just picking out their flats, they're less likely to, to move around in the tray and get shifted and damaged. So it has several purposes. Polystyrene trays have, an, have a little bit of an issue. One of the things that you need to think about when you're um, buying a specific brand of polystyrene tray, order in a case or two before you, you choose a certain size. And the first thing you wanna do when you open up the case is break open and see how hard it is to separate the, the trays from each other. We've all had to pull uh, Tupperware apart, right? And sometimes it can be a challenge and some trays are easier than others. Make sure that the drainage holes and the flats are consistent. You need consistency in the product because you, if, they're not, if the drainage holes are not consistent, 
each flat is going to require different uh, watering tactics. And that's why it's not a good practice to mix trays on a bench. You want to look for sharp edges. Um, polystyrene um, gives a nasty paper cut. And it uh, is not good for your growers or your retail handlers or your consumers. And it has to be durable, easy to handle, and no sagging. So most manufacturers of um, bedding plant trays and flats, uh, they spend a good amount of time making sure that their product is precisely sized for automation. Um, here we have uh, a plug tray in the background where this uh, uh, transplanter is p picking it up and it's, it's a critical that it all be lined up correctly for the automated systems. Some vacuum form containers, uh, like I said, offset printing for branding and barcoding. Um, branding uh, is, is uh, the way of the future. Uh, one of the th things that we're working on with branding, for instance, uh, Proven Winters is a good example. Uh, you can see Proven Winters pots in any retail outlet in the country, whether it be Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Gullies, uh, Bath, they all have it. But the place that they saw Proven Winters to begin with was in the magazine, the gardening magazine, Sunset, uh, Southern Living, or the magazine that of their choice and it, it one of the idea or they see it on as an advertisement on home and garden TV or something like that and so they're looking for that brand identification so that we when they come in and they see that and a typically speaking a proven winners grower it, they're also going to get point of purchase materials they are going to have banners that they can hang in the greenhouse they'll have logos that they put on the shopping carts they uh, they'll have buttons for the um, the sales associates to wear so they get some uniformity in branding proven winners is probably one of the good examples but also all the um, retailers will put some sort of a branding on them as well um, barcoding uh, barcoding is almost is, is standard in, in almost every industry now uh, so it has to be there. Um, these, uh, these are stickers, um, but typically uh, as they go through the machine, uh, the, the stickers will, can be put on in the same spot and they're red as they move through the machine or red, they're in a convenient place for the um, checkout uh, to move the people out of the lines more quickly. And of course, here's the proven winner point of purchase. We've got the, the uh, injection molded pot. Um, this is a white pot. Um, there's lots of data that shows that white pots uh, transmit light and root greening is a problem. So the uh, proven winner's pot is white on the outside and black on the inside. And so it's been co-extruded with two different colors. So it has a black pot and a white pot. And it's uh, designed that way. And it's also got a, a slit cut in it so the tag itself is put into the pot and locked in place. Custom colors, tag inserts, co-extrusion. So here are some examples. Um, some growers that are large enough own their own dyes and, and the uh, pot companies will supply their own pot materials and it um, almost always the co-extrusion liner is going to be black to prevent root green. Okay, so I told you that an 11 by 21 tray, we call it a 1020 tray. And the coating of the industry uh, is very standard. And these are all the flat inserts that go into uh, that 1020 tray. So, for instance, it's all based upon the number of units and the number of units per pack. So we, the unit, this particular one is a, called a 1201 in the lower uh, left-hand corner. It's got 12 packs with one opening, so it's a 1201. Whereas we move over to um, to the, the top, 
Uh, let's go to the, um, uh, the second from the left. It's a 306. It's got three packs with six chambers. Um, 412, four packs for, and so forth and so forth. And so in a, what you say if, if you're going to buy a um, 1206, uh, what the 1206 means, you've got 12 packs with six plants per pack. And that's a marketing unit. So a 1206 tray is probably going to be more expensive than a 1204 tray as far as when it's done producing. Because the 1204 has got 48 plants, where the 1206 has got 72 plants. Make sense? Now some growers will actually have their, their flat inserts so that the ribs in between the uh, soils in the different flats is lower so the roots can actually grow together. And Welby Gardens does this particularly so that they can um, either sell it as a larger transplant for the landscape market and a smaller transplant for the retail market in the same tray. So here's an 804. Got eight packs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with four packs four plants per pack. 806 still has eight trays, eight packs with six units per um, tray. 1203 and a 1204. Which one do you choose? Well, it depends on your market. It also depends on if you, what kind of mechanical equipment you're using because you're not going to be able to feed a 1204 and an 806 in the same line on the same mechanical transplanter. It's got to be reprogrammed. Now it might be just the push of a button, however it's got to be done. Here's a 1206, 1801, 18 units, 20, 2101, so like the 1801 this would be typical for perennials. And a 3601, that might be typical for liners. Most retailers now require barcoding of some kind. Um, they, they make inkjet printers that work in line on the pot, on the transplanting machines so that uh, the inkjet printer will print it as it goes by. I'm gonna, uh, here's a picture of an inkjet printer that's printing some flats. Uh, you have to make sure that if you're going to inkjet print the flats themselves, the pack themselves, that the pack has to extend above the flat r top, the edge of the flat. Um, it, it happens in line, it happens very quickly, um, and so forth. Another product line that's been around for a long time is, is a product called a Jiffy, or a Jiffy Pot. And these are peat pots it's, been, it's sold by a company out of Denmark. They've been around for a long time. And the peat pellets are um, available in many different sizes, many different containers can be planted. And the idea behind the peat pot is that it, it feels more earth friendly because you're going to plant the pot. Um, you need to make sure that instruct, if you're a retailer and you're talking to your consumer, that they pick off the top of the peat pot when they plant it. In fact, I like to rip them all the way off in mine. But if you leave the, the edge of the peat pot sticking above the ground, it's going to wick moisture and act like a candle wick and dry out the pot. So the, peat, the idea behind the peat pot is it's a, it's a compressed peat product. Um, it's got some uh, polymers in it to make it bind, and the roots can come out. Uh, they have different kinds of peat pots, all different kinds, some with holes, some with not. Uh, if it doesn't have holes in it, what I like to do is take a long rod and punch a hole through the stack of them anyway. I like a l I, the peat pots don't drain as quickly as you would like. They come here's a five inch one by four inches tall. Um, then there's the tar paper pots and other kind of pots as well. Actually, there's a new pot out there called a cow pot. Have anybody seen the cow pot? Cow pie pot. It's made by a dairy farm in, uh, in New England. Um, it's actually fe featured on Dirty Jobs and where they take uh, dairy manure and process it and make a pretty good product. Some of the higher end retailers have, I know I've seen them in Lafayette Florist and Garden Center. Pretty darn good pot. 
So in the Jiffy Pots, they make all different kinds. These are uh, taller ones are for like seedlings, tree seedlings. There's the standards. Um, they're designed to fit in standard trays, standard equipment. The industry is uniform. Uh, peat pellets, um, there are different sizes and what they do is they come as a compressed wafer and we soak them in water and eventually we can grow them out. Um, I like peat pellets uh, for um, growing cucurbits, if you're selling cucurbits in the retail center, um, because the cucurbits have very brittle roots and they don't transplant well. Um, this is a perfect uh, uh, delivery vehicle for cucurbit seedlings. Uh, this happens to be um, yellow crooknet squash. Okay, one of the things that when you're choosing containers, you need to think about the container again. The deeper the cell, the deeper the depth of the container, you can have more oxygen and have better root development. However, oftentimes if it's too deep, it can also uh, cause problems with um, being too wet. The container depth, the smaller the container, as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the it's just how much water it holds is going to be greatly exaggerated. So for instance, so many of you remember from uh, greenhouse management, I brought in a sponge and I forgot my sponge, so I'll make a little video and show you. But the sponge only holds so much water. You turn it on an edge, water comes out because the, the depth of the chamber is, is, is decreased. Turn it on the edge again and more water falls out. So. <coughs> Um, the total spore space, I mean the sponge volume never changes, the total pore space never changes, the total porosity um, doesn't change, but how much water holding capacity has changes with the height of the, height of the, of the. So the container volume is going to say, it's like for instance here we've got container uh, potting soil, it's got 13% solid matter, but we changed the size of the pot, six inch pot, 13% is solid matter, 67 water, air is 20. And you can see as we get down into the smaller trays, like a 648, that's 648 units of a 10 by 20 flat. In the heated, heated cells, most people do 288s. Uh, you can see how the solid matter changes and how much more water is there. So you have to adjust your, um, texture of your potting mix to adjust for container sizes. <coughs>